under 37 minutes to go. Carolina, how are things looking from the technical side of things? So far, everything continues to appear nominal. We are um, we are checking off the steps in our in our uh, our countdown procedure, and uh, kind of the next major milestone that <coughs> we anticipate is um, some software configurations at around T minus 30 minutes um, before we step into our final preparations and our terminal count. Great to hear. We've got some more questions in the queue, so let's see what's coming up next. Uh, a question, does performing static fire tests put an additional strain on the rocket before it launches? That's a great question. So um, our, if, if you um, are not familiar, one of the final preparations that we complete um, is a static fire test of the vehicle, which means we essentially go through everything exactly as we will on launch day, with the exception of letting go of the rocket. So we light all five of those Delphin engines um, and run them for, for several seconds to verify that everything is working as it should, and then we shut down everything, and, um, and that is one of our final steps in preparing for launch. So the rocket is designed specifically to be able to handle this test in addition to, um, in, in addition to multiple launch attempts. Um, so it does not cause, um, not cause any issues because the system is designed to be capable of that. That's good. And that's even though this rocket is a one-time use rocket, it's an expendable rocket, but the engineers, when designing the system, designed it for multiple cycles of fueling, pressurization, and engine firing, right? Yes, that's correct. So we design our, our system um, for, for multiple tests and, all, and to be able to go through all of the necessary launch preparations with margin um, and including that static fire test. I believe we actually have a video of that static fire test. Michael, can we show this? Ten. Water on. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. And again, that was completed uh, last week, I believe, and that actually ties back into our next question here, because Khalid asked, how much time does it take to set up a launch pad for Astra? That's a wonderful question. So um, everything that you see that um, is not, you know, part of that, like that, that fixed infrastructure of the pad, there's some lightning towers, there's some, some uh, light lighting fixtures that you can see. Um, those all stay on the pad, but everything else we bring with us, and we can really set up a pad in, in a matter of, of days um, with a red team of, um, of about five folks who are on the ground setting up everything. So we really design our system to be as nimble as possible. And, uh, and like we've mentioned before, everything fits inside shipping containers and can be set up by a very small team in a very short amount of time. There you go. Um, we have two questions next coming up that I'm actually going to combine into one question because I feel like they go together. Um, one uh, person is asking, do we, know, how do we know much about today's payload? And then the other question is, how does this improve life on Earth? So, Carolina, can you talk about these missions and how they're improving life on Earth? Sure. So there was a brief intro video that we, we, post, we showed at the top of the broadcast, but um, there are four teams that have... Um, each have a CubeSat aboard today's mission. Um, they come from the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, University of California at Berkeley, New Mexico State University, and NASA's Johnson Space Center. So I can talk about each of those four, um, four spacecraft a little bit. Um, BAMA-1 is from the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, and it's a technology demonstration mission that will demonstrate a drag sail module and rapidly deorbit the satellite. And this helps reduce space debris and reduce the risk to operational satellites, space stations, and crewed vehicles, which is really interesting and, and exciting. Um, INCA, which stands for Ionospheric Neutron Content Analyzer, is from New Mexico State University. It's a scientific investigation mission that will study the latitude and time dependencies of the neutron spectrum in low Earth orbit for the first time. And the purpose of this is to improve current space weather models and mitigate threats to space and airborne assets. And it, the measurements come from a brand new directional neutron spectrometer, 
which is being developed in conjunction with NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and the University of New Hampshire. Uh, CubeSat, with a Q, uh, is from the University of California, Berkeley. It's a technology demonstration mis mission that will test and characterize the effects of space conditions on quantum gyroscopes using nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. And these nitrogen vacancy centers are defect points in diamond with quantum properties that allow scientists to form gyroscopes that measure angular velocity. Um, so these technologies are well suited for space because they are very accurate, small, and tolerant to radiation. And our fourth payload R is R5S1 from NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. And it is intended to demonstrate a fast and cost-effective way to build successful CubeSats. In addition to demonstrating some technologies that are important to in-space inspection, which could help make crewed space exploration safer and more efficient. R5S1 could prove a cheaper way to demonstrate crucial technologies like high-performance computers, cameras, algorithms, and a new way for satellites to transmit pictures to the ground. Um, and so those are four very different, different uh, spacecraft on board, but they all have very exciting missions that they are going to conduct. And you know, the second, the second part of that question is really how do these improve life on Earth and um, you know, keeping, getting better weather information, getting more technology from high performance computers, making those, those uh, um, spacecraft more accurate and, and able to deorbit more easily to protect other spacecraft and uh, be responsible stewards of, of space. Those are all really important missions that, you know, maybe we won't, you won't notice in your in your day to day life, but they definitely make make an impact. So we're very proud to be selected as the launch provider for this mission and these four incredible payloads. Absolutely awesome to hear about those payloads. And if you ever want to know how smart the people working on these space flight missions are, just read about their payloads because there's some really cool stuff in there. We've just passed the 30 minute mark and I actually want to cut it over to the countdown net because the teams are actually moving into the final software load. So let's listen in to Chris Hoffman and the rest of the launch team. Tango and AV1 manage polling. Toggle, do only ground polling. Toggling, do only ground polling. Okay, this takes us into step 119, loading late load configs. Delphin, are you ready? Dolphin is ready. Please provide. Okay. Igniter is 180. Loading config 180, Victor 3, on the Igniter controller. Load. Engine Alpha 174. Loading config 174, Victor 1. Load. Engine Bravo 175, Victor 1. Loading config 175, Victor 1. Bravo. Load. Engine Charlie 176, Victor 13. Loading config 176, Victor 13 on engine Charlie. Load. Engine Delta 177, Victor 13. Loading config 177, Victor 13 on engine Delta. Load. Engine Echo 178, Victor 15. Loading config 178, Victor 15 on engine Echo. Load. Ether, please provide your late load config. Ether config 183, Victor 7, please. Loading config 183, Victor 7 on Ether. Good load. And GNC, please provide an updated guidance config for us. Five, Victor 143. Loading config 5, Victor 143 on guidance. Good load. 
Copy, good loads and all late load configs. Per step 120, Tango, in VB1, turn on off PDBs. Please give me a GNC setup. Toggling GNC setup. have finished their late load configs for all of the engines and as well as the guidance system so that's another milestone checked off the list now coming up on T minus 26 minutes and counting and everything is still on track for an on time liftoff again the launch window opens at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern time and everything on track right now in the meantime we've got some more questions so why don't we head that way uh, Carolina my next question this is the first launch from Cape Canaveral Florida and that means reaching some different orbital inclinations because we touched on this during the last broadcast over in Kodiak Alaska how different launch sites lend themselves to different orbits can you talk a little bit about that sure so um, yes Thomas you're exactly right as, as you just mentioned um, one of the things that helps determine which orbits you have access to in space um, is the location where you, you launch from, in particular the latitude. Um, so, so Kodiak, very far, uh, very far north, um, is great for, for reaching higher orbits like polar and sun-synchronous orbits. Um, but a lot of spacecraft want to be uh, closer to middle inclinations um, for, for a number of reasons, for tracking weather, um, for being communication satellites that, that uh, want to be over more populated areas of the globe. Um, so the Cape Canaveral location is great for reaching some of those mid-inclination locations. So um, today's mission will be heading to an inclination of 41 degrees and an altitude of 500 kilometers. Um, so uh, great. So to you know, just to recap, the Cape Canaveral location will help us provide our customers with access to new destinations in space and um, our. We are very grateful to our partners for helping make this launch possible. And a bit of orbital mechanics to go along with that. Sometimes if you have a mission that the inclination maybe isn't as important to the mission and other factors for the orbit are more important, um, you might want to launch closer to the equator because it is actually simply easier to reach orbit in the first place um, if you launch closer to the equator, such as Cape Canaveral, because you get a little bit of extra boost from Earth's spin. Um, so that's another factor that plays into how the launch sites are, are chose, chosen for different missions. Um, but speaking of that, this is the first Astra mission launching from Cape Canaveral, like we just talked about. Also the first Astra mission to deploy payloads into orbit. So those are very big historical milestones for Astra. But we also wanted to just pay a quick tribute to another historical space happening that happened in space history today. Right, Carolina? That's right. Um, on February 7th, 1984, so 38 years ago, NASA astronaut Bruce McCandless II became the first human being to walk in space untethered. Uh, McCandless stepped out of the Space Shuttle Challenger and into nothingness. As he moved away from the spacecraft, he floated freely without any earthly anchor. And if you've ever seen those images of an astronaut floating in the blackness of space above Earth, that is the, the spacewalk that we are talking about today. Um, and uh, 38 years ago today, that, that incredible image was, was taken. And you hear that, everybody in chat? There's the shuttle reference of the day. We've got there. It only took us a little under 40 minutes, but we got to the shuttle reference. It's an NSF stream. We have to. It's a rule. <laughs> Moving on, we've got another question to talk a little bit about the mission controllers who are controlling the countdown. Like I mentioned, Chris Hoffman is our flight director, but there is a team at Astra in Alameda who is behind today's launch. And Carolina, can you give us an introduction to the team today? Sure. So um, we have our, our team here, here at Mission Control. They are sitting uh, directly behind me when, when you, my camera is on, but they are, they are right behind me. Um, starting with uh, Chris Hoffman with the, with the Mohawk, he is our flight director. Hill Hudson is our flight activities officer, or FAO, with that uh, googly-eyed console. Chris May is our command and data handling officer. Um, and Claire Gauthier in the orange sweater is our uh, Tango, who's our vehicle controller, who's actually 
the one that you hear, you know, loading the software configurations onto the computer. Um, Christopher Rossi, the wind destroyer, is our GNC um, representative today. And then finally, we will have our flight safety um, FTS person, uh, Rose, who seems to be up from her desk at the moment. And you'll see those teams working throughout the rest of the countdown and during the flight today. Again, 21 minutes and counting. All systems go right now. Um, those are the p personnel in Alameda, California at Astra's headquarters. There are also some other members of the team here in Cape Canaveral, right, Carolina? Yes, that's right. So on the ground in, in Cape Canaveral, we have a team, um, a very small team. We have known as the Red Team. Uh, Ryan Hirschfeld is our safety officer. Adam Frisch is our Red Lead. Robert Freeman. Eric Larson, Sam Hirschap, Benjamin Whelan, Rusty Haller um, are our red team. And then we have Eric Steiny Steinberg and Thomas Cannon, who are our IT uh, folks on the line, which um, we are thankful for all of your help in setting up our systems <clears throat> and hope you're enjoying uh, the Florida weather, which is m much nicer than it would be in Kodiak in February. And uh, in addition to, to helping us be nimble, it has also helped us limit travel to have such a small team on, on site, which has been a key consideration during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. All members of the team are taking regular COVID-19 tests to protect the health and safety of everyone involved in this mission. Excellent. As we come up on 20 minutes and counting, the teams are working through some additional steps in the countdown. Carolina, can you just give us an update what the teams are working on now? Sure, so uh, we are about to set, step into our go, no go poll um, to get into our terminal count. And uh, essentially the team is just confirming that all of the systems are, are ready for launch, that our winds look acceptable. And in just a few minutes here, we'll see our, our water deluge test and we will step into our terminal count from there. That water deluge test is a very visible sign that the countdown is proceeding and getting towards that terminal count. You will not mistake it when it happens and we'll draw your attention to it again in a couple minutes here. Um, before we get into that, I'll take a couple last minute questions before we really get into the business end here. Uh, Nico asks, what material is this rocket made of? That's a great question. So one of the things that makes our system unique is we try and use very simple materials. Um, much of the first stage you see is made out of aluminum. We try and stay away from you know, carbon fiber and any really fancy aerospace grade materials and that allows us to uh, manufacture quickly and cost effectively so that our customers can have the best access to, uh, to orbit that they can have. And that's a trade-off, right? That's a trade-off between the cost of manufacturing and, and producing those vehicles and the performance they give. And in order to use cheaper materials, you have to design it so that obviously the vehicle will still perform as you need to. Right. It's something that we're, we're constantly working towards and, and trying to push the envelope with what we can get out of our, out of our vehicles. There you go. Uh, so I'm seeing some notes in chat that Mission Control in Alameda is approximately 50% Chris. And we have a thing in NSF where a lot of people named Chris as well. So I mean, there's this trend going on between Ash and NSF. I wanted to no notice that I see that in chat and I appreciate the comment. Yes, we do have quite a few, uh, quite a few Chris's. Um, <coughs> <laughs> but uh, what, what you're not seeing when, you, when we see that Mission Control is that we also have the, the engineers, the responsible engineers for each of the systems that you may hear um, on and off uh, comms as we, we switch to the countdown. Um, they're distributed throughout our factory at their normal desks um, who are monitoring their systems. Um, and uh, there aren't too many Chris's in, in that group uh, on the rest of our, <laughs> our comms. So um, a bit of a, bit of a uh, high Chris sample in that mission control shot. <laughs> there you go, gotta have a larger sample size for a more representative uh, a better representation of the team, uh, for sure. <laughs> Again, T minus 17 and a half minutes, and we are coming up on that water test. You'll see, uh, actually, Carolina, why don't you talk about what are we going to expect with this water test coming up? Well, I believe I actually just heard that our water system is correctly configured and does not need to go through that uh, go through that test at the moment. But uh, if you were w joined us earlier and saw that static fire video, there is a large plume of water um, that, that uh, shoots out from the base of the vehicle, and that's for... 
um, fire suppression and making sure that nothing on the ground close to the vehicle um, is ign ignited when we light those five first stage engines. So we will look out for that water deluge um, in the final moments of our terminal count. The launch team is doing that thing where they make me look silly again, just say, oh, we already tested it, it's good to go. We're not <laughs> gonna do the fancy thing that you just alluded to, but it's fine, whatever, it's okay. All right, so we're coming up on just a minute and a half again. Again, at that 15 minute mark, we're gonna expect a final clear to launch pool. Actually, at around 60 minutes, excuse me, we'll be into the terminal count at T minus 15 minutes. So in a couple seconds here, let's go ahead and listen into the countdown net as flight director. Uh, I'm sorry, take that back. Did I have the time wrong? I think I might have. We will stand by for the, uh, the poll in a little bit. My apologies. Um, some other steps going before there. But either way, we're coming up on terminal count at T-minus 15 minutes. In the meantime, let's go back to some more questions then. If you have questions, tag us with at NASA Spaceflight. And our first question, oh, this is going to set up Michael nicely. Are there any cameras on the rockets, says uh, Henny. Yes, Henny, we have lots of onboard cameras, and we hope to get some great, uh, great views of them during our <laughs> flight today. This is a, um, a gray view from one of our cameras, which will hopefully turn into a much uh, nicer shot. Um, but so we do some, have some venting going on there. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. This is a great view um, of uh, the the upper stage. This uh, this kind of top right part of the screen. Um, that's the fairing. So we will see that fairing open up. Um, and uh, the payloads deploy um, during our flight. We'll, of course, be looking into those onboard views as well. And there's a great view of the payloads. You can actually see the, their payload deployers mostly. The CubeSat deployers, the CubeSat sit in a deployer on top of the upper stage. And uh, hopefully once that fairing separates and, we're, and the rocket is up into orbit, uh, we should also hopefully get to see them flying away, which will be very cool. Uh, but that was, those are those four CubeSat payloads uh, ready for their ride to space just about 15 minutes from now. All right, and as we enter 15 minutes, Carolina, do you want to give us an update on what the teams are going to be working through now leading up to that terminal count poll that's coming up in a few minutes and then the final steps of the countdown? Sure. So in just a few moments, we'll listen into that go, no go poll. Right now, the, the team is working through uh, the, the final preparations, and we are going to move into the last the last um, steps of our, of our countdown, um, which include um, you know, making sure that all of the systems continue to be nominal, and then we will hand over the vehicle to internal control, um, and uh, in the last the last moments before flight. Absolutely, and uh, for those who are just joining us, let's do a great brief recap of what we're about to watch as well. Again, this is the Elena 41 mission for NASA. It is the first mission that Astra is launching to deploy payloads into orbit, and also the first launch that Astra is conducting from Space Launch Complex 46 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The mission is also called VCLS Demo 2, which stands for Venture Class Launch Services, the NASA's dedicated small sat launch services program. And uh, the four payloads on board, three of them are from different university teams from the University of Alabama, University of California, Berkeley, and New Mexico State University, as well as a fourth payload from the NASA Johnson Space Center. All of those payloads were selected through the CubeSat launch initiative from NASA and sponsored to be put onto this mission. And that is, of course, why you see that beautiful NASA meatball logo on the payload fairing today, indicating that today's mission is for the American Space Program. And as we come up on 13 minutes here, teams are going through the last couple of steps that precede the Go No Go poll. And we'll be listening into that in just about two minutes here. Um, meanwhile, visually, you're seeing the rocket on the pad. You can see the tank, the one tank getting frosty and the lower tank below it. Carolina, I believe that is the kerosene or the, yeah, the kerosene tank on the bottom which is at mostly ambient temperature. You won't see any uh, frost on that, but the liquid oxygen tank above it is super cool because obviously oxygen is not liquid at ambient temperature. So that's why we're seeing that frost on the vehicle, right? Yes, that's right. So so that sort of middle third of the vehicle um, is actually the same sort of silver color that you see in the bottom part of the vehicle, but it is covered in a coat of, um, of frost from that very, very cold liquid oxygen. And so our propellants on both stages are liquid oxygen and kerosene. Um, we use RPX, which um, is essentially a, a highly refined form of kerosene or, or mineral spirits. Um, and together with, uh, they, they move through our engines and 
generate the force to get us to orbit. And then above that, of course, there's the interstage with the Astra logo and the U.S. flag, which contains the sort of the bottom part of the upper stage, and then payloads on top, and that payload fairing. All right, let's go ahead and listen into the countdown net as we are getting close to the uh, continuing terminal count, and let's listen to the teams as they continue to work. Astra is calling a hold at this time. Thanks for standing by. As you heard, we are we are in a hold right now. Um, the team is looking into um, wind limits, and uh, and of course, you know the the weather conditions can change pretty un unpredictably. So we're keeping an eye on that, and we expect to have more updates for you shortly. And again, for those who are joining us from earlier in the broadcast, today's launch window does extend till 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. So there's plenty of time to resolve this hold. And uh, the clock stopped at just 11.46, so still pretty late in the count. They should be uh, a quick uh, cycle back and go again once these issues are f confirmed to be resolved and ready to go. But we'll provide those updates as soon as we have them. That's right. And um, we also just, just uh, heard on comms that the vehicle continues to, to be nominal, so we are... Um, just waiting on, on these last uh, final final um, issues. We'll likely uh, reset the clock to um, probably around T minus 15 minutes when the hold is released. Okay, and we are still waiting to hear back about the status of this hold. We'll provide that update as soon as we have it. Hopefully, we'll be resolved soon. But in the meantime, let's take some time to take a couple more questions here. Um, and Musical Wolves in chat asks, is this the same launch pad equipment as Kodiak or new pad equipment for Cape Canaveral? Um, that's a wonderful question. We use the same equipment at, at our sites with uh, modifications as needed for, um, for different, you know, little quirks that, that each range will have. Um, so this this equipment um, is designed to be compatible with Cape Canaveral, but otherwise it is identical to um, the launch equipment that we would use in Kodiak. 
So that means they're going to be shipping different sets of equipment to different ranges. Like, you don't take the one launcher, reconfigure it, and then send it to Cape Canaveral, and then reconfigure it back if you're going back to Kodiak or something like that. They need to be separate sets uh, so that you can also be launching from different campaigns from different sites at the same time, right? Right. If we, uh, Of course, if we're launching from different sites th at the <laughs> same time, <laughs> we can't be it in two be places difficult. at once. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yes, the, the system is designed so that um, we can make those configuration changes and use it um, interoperably at, at our different um, launch sites. So theoretically, there's nothing to prevent us from sending this uh, precise set to Kodiak. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, another question here from Caleb says, why does it look like there is smoke coming out of the rocket? I don't believe that's smoke. I believe it's actually condensation, right? Yes. So, so you can see that there's some sort of condensation looking um, almost like steam coming off the vehicle. Um, and then you can see those uh, those vent lines that that um, are are look to have a little bit more more oomph to them than than just the condensa condensation uh, that's evaporating off the vehicle. And so those those are um, uh, Vent, uh, our venting system just ensures that um, our our tanks are maintaining the appropriate um, the appropriate pressure while um, the vehicle is being operated. And by proxy, those vents also help maintain different temperatures because if you're up on your chemistry, changing the pressure will change the temperature in the tanks. So you can also use that to control your thermal conditions on board the rocket. Uh, it's kind of a neat physics thing that uh, is used to make sure the rocket is at the right conditions for flight. Yes, that is exactly right. Got another uh, sort of physics-y question here from Sebastian, who asks, how do the rockets using liquid fuel get fuel into the engine in microgravity without it just floating through the tank? That's a great question. So that mostly affects our upper stage engine. Um, our upper stage ether engine is a pressure-fed engine. So um, actually, the pressure inside of the tanks itself keeps the propellants flowing to the engine um, in, in space. There you go. Uh, and then another question, uh, engine question. Isaac is asking, how much thrust do the engines generate? And that depends on which engine we're talking about, right? Because there's two. Right. Well, technically, there's six. <laughs> well, but, two, uh, different, I should, uh, yeah, two different types of engines. My apologies. Right. There's two different types of engines on the vehicle. So our first stage um, is powered by five Delphin engines, which each produce 6,500 pounds of thrust for a total of 32,500 pounds of thrust on the first stage. Uh, they are electric pump-fed engines. And the upper stage is powered by one ether engine, which is, as we just mentioned, a pressure-fed engine that produces 740 pounds of thrust. Um, and both uh, stages are filled with LOX and kerosene, so we have this, the, the same propellants on both stages. There you go. And then also uh, another question here. Uh, we actually didn't address this yet. We should talk about the range asset, which caused an issue on Saturday's attempt, asking about that. Can we talk a little bit about how that was resolved and prepared for today? Right. So um, there was an issue with the radar system um, on Saturday. Um, it was an asset that um, that is on the range. And um, thankfully, we were able to um, resolve that issue uh, yesterday and prepare for today's launch attempt so that the the issue that caused Saturday's scrub uh, will not be a problem today. Glad to hear. And again, that's a partnership with the range here at Cape Canaveral. Space Launch Delta 45 is the Space Force wing, which is oversees the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. And that includes the range tracking assets and things that are used by all launch providers here at Cape Canaveral. Um, so an important partner there. Uh, another question here asking, how are these missions going to be affordable if the rockets are not reusable? They're expendable single-use vehicles. Yes, that's a wonderful question. So um, reusability is only one piece of the equation when it comes to cost. The ways that um, Astra focuses right now on, on um, cost is using... Um, using simple materials, we, we stay away from a lot of composites and the fancy aerospace types of materials. Um, and we, we use a lot of automation in our systems. Um, as we've mentioned before, it takes very few people to operate one of these vehicles to set up our launch site. Um, you know, the, the team that is, is developing the vehicle is, is a very deep bench, but, uh, but to actually conduct our launch operations is a very small group of people. Um, and so those are some of the ways 
that we focus on um, keeping costs down with our launch vehicle. Got it. And of course, there's also mass production, right? Because the eventual plan is to be launching ver so frequently that your production cadence will bring down sort of your overhead costs. And that's a manufacturing quirk that affects th uh, these expendable vehicles as well. Yes, exactly. That's right. We we hope to mass produce these these uh, these vehicles, and that is definitely one of the ways to bring down the cost. Um, and uh, we we pride ourselves on making our system as simple as possible to build and scale because we hope to provide um, un almost unlimited access to space for our customers. Gotcha. Um, also seeing some questions in chat again, if you have just joining us, the teams are currently in a hold right now looking at some wind data and making sure that uh, those issues are resolved prior to proceeding with the count or expecting some sort of recycle here prior to resuming the countdown. Um, and we'll give you updates as soon as we have them. Uh, but right now we're continuing to take some questions uh, as we wait for a resolution. Again, the launch, con uh, launch window excuse me, continues until 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so we have just under three hours to go before the end of the window. Plenty of time. But questions, if you tag us with at NASA Spaceflight in chat, we'll be able to see those questions through some software that Michael wrote. Thank you, Michael, producing the streams as usual. And uh, we'll go ahead and answer as many of those as we can over the course of the broadcast. We've got Carolina Grossman from Astra, the expert in the field. I'm just here to relay questions realistically. <laughs> but uh, let me see what other questions we may have. Uh, we can maybe talk a little bit about the planned flight profile for today. What are the kind of milestones once rocket the rocket is ready to lift off we would expect to see as the rocket ascends and proceeds towards orbit? Yes, that's a great question. So um, we are, um, again, we are currently holding, but once we set that, that new T0 time, um, just a few seconds before liftoff, the engines will, the first stage engines will ignite. At T0 seconds, that will be liftoff. A few seconds later, the vehicle will begin its pitch over maneuver, and we expect to reach max Q at around 1 minute and 10 seconds. So that's the uh, point of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. It's a significant milestone for, for us. Um, around 2 minutes and 50 seconds, we have MECO, or main engine cutoff. And then in very quick succession, we have the fairing separation at 2 minutes and 55 seconds, stage se separation at 3 minutes, and then the upper stage ether engine ignites at approximately three minutes and five seconds into flight. Um, it runs for about five and a half minutes, and at that point we will have SECO, or second engine cutoff. And then finally, we will have our payload deployment. This will be our first mission with deployed payloads um, at eight minutes and 40 seconds. And so we will be deploying the four CubeSats aboard today's mission. Um, and at that point, if we have achieved all of those milestones, are, we will be very excited to have completed the, the primary objectives of our flight and have achieved mission success. There we go. And a question about those payloads, again, if you are just joining us, asking about what the target orbit and the payload sizes uh, on board today's flight. So the target orbit is inclined 41 degrees at an altitude of 500 kilometers. And you can actually see from an onboard camera there that uh, those CubeSat payloads are sitting in their deployers. There are 3U CubeSats sitting on top of the ether-powered upper stage of rocket in that payload fairing right now. And of course, we are hoping that those payload fairings will separate out in space and those payloads will be able to be deployed after a successful launch soon. Um, so staying tuned for uh, that. Again, we're in a hold right now, but stay tuned for further updates. Uh, but those are those payloads, and I love those onboard views giving us a glimpse into the payloads just anxiously waiting their ride to space. Another question here, Matthias is asking, how is the weather looking now? Looks too scrubby? No, I don't think so. Weather is actually green right now, right, Carolina? Um, yeah, I believe we are. The weather is, is looking good at the moment, and we are... Um, hopefully awaiting some news about uh, releasing this hold soon. Absolutely. I know they were looking at those wind limits to make sure that they are going to remain green and stay where they need to be, so we're going to keep an update on that and make sure that they're all ready to go when to release this hold. And again, stay tuned for updates on that. But uh, keeping on with some questions here, William says, uh, where in the countdown do you hand off to the flight computers? 
Yes, so the, the handover to the flight computers happens um, in the final moments before launch. You'll hear, um, once we're listening to the countdown net, um, our, uh, our flight director, Chris Hoffman, call out vehicle is on internal control. Um, that's at 60 seconds before T0. Um, so you can listen and hear when, uh, when that milestone in particular takes place. Gotcha. Okay, we're staying tuned for further updates, but right now keeping going with some questions. So tag us at NASA Spaceflight, and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. Uh, we did talk about the flight profile, and actually I want to highlight this because Rocket 3 is a little bit unique in that that payload fairing has to separate before the upper stage actually separates, right? Um, yes, that is correct. Our fairing separation happens right before stage separations, but these these milestones, um, you know, we, we just talked through the, the mission timeline uh, between main engine cutoff and the upper stage ignition. Um, we we run through some some significant milestones in just 15 seconds. So we have our main engine cutoff, fairing separation, stage separation, and then the upper stage ignition all within 15 seconds of each other in pretty pretty quick su succession. And again, we are continuing to stand by for further word of the status of today's countdown, and we'll stay tuned, uh, stay by for further updates, and we'll provide them again as soon as we have them. The team's working through them right now.
All right, everybody. Thank you for your patience. The teams are still in a hold right now, but I believe we have an update from the status of the countdown. So, Carolina, what are the teams working on right now? Yes, Thomas. The team is still looking at uh, some some wind data and reviewing that. Um, where we try and get the latest up to the minute information and run through simulations to make sure that everything will be okay despite the changing conditions. So that is what the team is reviewing right now. Um, we are optimistic that we'll be able to uh, continue um, with our launch countdown um, shortly. So um, in the meantime, we, we are still holding. So thanks for your patience and thanks for, for bearing with us. Didn't want to like come on and talk about something when we didn't have an update, so we went and got that update first. Thank you all for staying tuned. And again, more updates forthcoming as soon as we have them. But we do have some more questions in the queue, so we can go back to that if you'd like. And uh, right on queue, we're talking about releasing this hold, hopefully before too long. Um, Mist does ask, what is the decision-making process like to resume a countdown once you've called a hold? Um, yeah, so so we will take all of the information from um, from the issues that we've been troubleshooting and uh, verify that we have uh, not encountered any new issues. For example, um, if we hold too long, there may be certain uh, blackout times specifically that we'll need in order to avoid uh, colliding with another object in space. Um, and so we'll coordinate with the range to make sure that we can set our new T0 time and uh, and we'll proceed with uh, with picking up the countdown. And on the same topic, there Noah asks, when does this window close? Sixteen hundred EST. That is correct. Four o'clock p.m. Eastern time, which is, if I do math, my head, twenty-one hundred UTC. I had to do that in my head real quick. Thank you. Uh, but that is our the end of the window. So plenty of time. A little under three hours to go. Um, and as you can see, the terminal count starts at 15 minutes prior to launch, so uh, there is plenty of time for the teams to resume the count once that wind data is verified to be nominal and that the teams will be ready to go. So no worries just yet. Um, another question here, Al asks, after main engine cutoff, or Mika, what happens to the first stage of the rocket? Right, so um, MECO stands for main engine cutoff, and that's the point where the first stage engines will have done their job and, um, and they will be shutting off because uh, we have run out of, out of fuel. So after that point, once we separate the stages, um, the, the first stage will fall back towards Earth. Um, we work very closely um, with, uh, with all of the relevant authorities to make sure that there is a safe area in the ocean for, uh, for the first stage to fall back to Earth um, in, and, uh, and it lands in the ocean. All right. And then a similar question, uh, moving on later in the flight profile, how long does it take for the rocket uh, to reach its final deployment as Alex? So how long before those payloads are in a stable orbit along with that upper stage and then deployed from that stage? Right, so um, we, we talked through the, the mission profile a uh, little while ago, um, but it takes just about nine minutes from T0 to, uh, to the payload deployment. So it is a pretty zippy, uh, zippy flight, although the, the upper stage runs for about five minutes and sometimes can feel like a long time to make sure that, uh, to be watching that, that uh, upper stage. So continue to wait for additional updates as the team continue to work uh, this hold here. But uh, on that same topic, talking about payload deployment, we should actually go into a little bit more detail about the payloads that are on board. We mentioned that there are four CubeSats on board, three from universities and one from the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. All four of them sponsored by NASA through the CubeSat launch initiative, uh, also referred to as the Educational Launch of Nanosatellites Program, which is that ELENA-41 designation. And Carolyn, can you tell us a little bit about what that program is all about? Sure. So uh, to start off with a fun fact, the program is actually named after the daughter of uh, senior mission manager Garrett Scrobot, who used to lead the Al Alana missions. Um, so it does stand for Educational Launch of Nanosatellites. 
And the service is well, the launch service is provided under a venture class launch services demonstration to um, contract. So if you, you see on the top left of the, your screen under that NASA meatball logo, you see the mission name is Alana 41 um, and the contract name as well, the VCLS Demo 2. Um, so this, this contract provides dedicated launch capabilities for smaller payloads and is awarded by the NASA Launch Services Program based at Kennedy Space Center. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things about this this uh, contract is the venture class missions help further the development and demonstration of new commercial launch vehicles, just like Astra's. Um, the the uh, small satellites that we have on board can tolerate a higher level of risk than many larger missions, which help us demonstrate and uh, help mitigate the risks associated with uh, new launch vehicles and really pave the way for new launch vehicles um, and future small spacecraft missions um, to move forward. Um, there's also a lot of interesting things about CubeSats. Uh, they're playing an increasingly larger role in exploration, technology demonstration, scientific research, and educational investigations at NASA. Um, one of the payloads on board is from Johnson Space Center in Houston. Um, these miniature satellites in general provide a low-cost platform for NASA missions such as planetary space exploration, Earth observation, fundamental Earth and space science, and technology demonstration like cutting-edge laser communications, energy storage, in-space propulsion, and autonomous movement capabilities. Um, another great thing about CubeSats, just like on our mission, is that um, educators have economical means to engage students in all phases of satellite development, operation, and data collection. So three of our four payloads are from uh, universities. Um, and the CSLI provides a uh, launch of CubeSat projects designed, built, and operated by students, teachers, and faculty, as well as NASA centers and nonprofits. So overall, to, to summarize this, um, missions from the Alana program provide a deployment opportunity or rideshare to space. And um, these, these program um, provides spaceflight education um, and some incredible research capabilities through very small CubeSats. Um, over the lifetime of the program, since its inception in 2010, the initiative has selected over 200 CubeSat missions, over 100 which have been launched, and more than 30 missions scheduled in the next 12 months. The CubeSats represent 42 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and 102 unique organizations. So if you um, are a student and interested in sending a CubeSat to space, um, you can check out the NASA CSLI call for proposals, which was most recently in August of 2021. There we go. So those are those CubeSat payloads that are on board today's flight and on across many missions across the spaceflight industry. Lots of CubeSats going up pretty much all the time, and those are the, makes up uh, a bulk of those small satellite payloads, actually. Um, of course, the primary objective for today's flight is deploying those CubeSats into low Earth orbit. The targeted orbit, once again, is 41 degrees inclination, so a mid-inclination launch, which is perfect for the Cape Canaveral launch flight. Um, also a 500 kilometer altitude low Earth orbit, circular low Earth orbit. Um, we do have a question in chat from Astro West who asks, are there any secondary objectives for today's flight beyond payload deployment? Um, yes, so uh, as we've mentioned, our primary mission objective today is to successfully deploy those four payloads aboard. Um, but uh, we at Astra, we are constantly launching and learning. So we have a number of secondary objectives, mostly for our engineering teams in order to um, gather more data about their systems and how they operate in space. Excellent. And of course, that's just part of gaining data from every single flight you fly, right? The more you fly your rocket, you're going to gain data from every flight. And that's always kind of a secondary objective to just keep building that flight heritage. Yes, exactly. We are, um, if you want to learn more about our, our approach in general, you can check out our website, astra.com. Um, we have um, our, our newsroom there where we post updates. Um, and you can even check out and, and read some of the things that we learned from our last missions, LV0006 in August and LV0007 in November, um, because even if the mission is, is successful, there's still a lot of things that we can learn.
And we've also got another question here that uh, I picked out from chat myself because I'm a big fan of the space shuttle here. And we've got a space shuttle relevant question, though. James asks, a fun hypothetical question, but could Rocket 3 fit inside the space shuttle payload bay? And would the shuttle be able to launch a fully fueled Rocket 3? Well, I've got the dimensions in front of me because I looked this up. And yes, I can confirm that Rocket 3 would fit in the payload bay. Uh, the Rocket 3 is 43 feet long, 52 inches in diameter. And you know what? I think I might go to say you could fit multiple Rocket 3s in a, in a space shuttle bay. Because the space <laughs> shuttle had a 60 foot long payload bay and 15 foot diameter uh, payload bay. So, yes, absolutely. And someone's got to launch Kerbal Space Program and do this now. <laughs> Yes, that is a fantastic question. Um, it's it's a that is a really fun fact that I'm very glad to have in my back pocket for now. <laughs> um, but yes, <laughs> the the uh, rocket that you see in front of you at 43 feet long, it fits inside a standard 45 foot shipping container, um, which also would have fit in the uh, payload bay of the space shuttle. And I think, and this is just me kind of spitballing off the top of my head, though, I'm pretty sure even fully fueled, the rocket would also still be light enough to be in a shuttle payload bay because the shuttle was a pretty heavy lifter. And I think it would make for a great two-stage kind of kick-stage deal if you wanted to launch CubeSats to Pluto or something. I don't know. That would be a little ridiculous, <laughs> but it'd be fun. Yes, I love that idea. Use, use the rocket as a kick-stage from the space shuttle to <laughs> <laughs> send, send CubeSats far, far away. Um, Yes, I, I'm not sure exactly the, the mass capacity of the, of the <laughs> shuttle, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I reckon that it, the rocket would be, be a comfortable passenger on board. Maybe even two of them, as you mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we do have another question. We've got a great view of the, the ground system, the launcher that the rocket is sitting on. And Tom asks, is that launch mount sat on the ground or does it have foundations? Uh, how does that kind of roll out and set up for launch? Right, so um, you can see that the uh, the rocket is sitting on, I almost just said the shuttle, the rocket is sitting <laughs> on um, a, a black structure. Um, there is a mounting interface um, with with the ground. There are, there are specific um, sort of hold downs there, and, um, and that is how we interface with, uh, with the ground. Um, but there is no... Um, no kind of permanently installed foundation aside from the concrete base. Um, that entire structure that you see the rocket sitting on is entirely portable. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Um, another question here. Is there a no-fly zone regarding today's launch? I believe that is standard practice here at both Cape Canaveral and other uh, launch ranges. No-fly zones, also marine hazard zones um, that are maintained, and that's part of that partnership with Space Launch Delta 45, right, Carolina? Right, so we do work with, um, with the range to make sure that um, not only planes, um, but also boats stay away from uh, the, the keep-out zone. Um, so in, in the event that we would um, encounter um, an aircraft or, or a boat in that keep out area, that would mean that we would hold until that, um, that issue is removed. So um, we actually have, a, um, a, I believe, a Coast Guard helicopter who's out making sure that the, the airways and, uh, and maritime area is, is clear for our launch today. Excellent. We actually caught a glimpse earlier, right before we went live, a Coast Guard helicopter circling the range. And uh, if our friend Steven out there catches that again, we'll try and show that. But uh, the security forces are out in force to uh, ensure that today's launch goes off without a hitch. Uh, another question here asking, how long can this rocket stay in a hold? Right, so we, um, we closely monitor all of the systems. Our launch window does extend to uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time, so we have um, about two and a half hours left, I believe, in, the, um, in, in our countdown time. Um, so we have, in, in the past, um, used, uh, used all that time, and, and the vehicle has been, been fine, so we're keeping an eye on everything, but um, we can be uh, ready to launch at any point within our window. Gotcha. I keep saying gotcha. I'm doing that thing where I say the same word over and over again. I gotta, I gotta, I'll come up with a new response next time you answer a question. But thank you to Carolina for all the expertise here. 
Uh, Andrew with a question asking, what is the typical lifespan of a CubeSat? Yeah, so um, I, I'm not a CubeSat expert here. <laughs> I'm more focused on, on uh, the rocket and the rest of the launch system. Um, however, uh, CubeSats can, can be pretty resilient and, and live, uh, live quite a long time. Um, it, it, uh, one of the depending factors is how, um, how much time it can spend on orbit before the orbit uh, decays, of course. Um, but CubeSats can, can have a lifespan of, of many years. And yeah, the, you know, the CubeSats are also designed to be sort of a low cost access to solution to space, which means that they are tailored towards, you know, short term missions in low Earth orbit. Usually some CubeSats are designed to last a long time. CubeSats have been sent to Mars, for example, but most of them operate in low Earth orbit and operate pretty short missions. But that also means there's potential for an extended mission, because if you plan for, let's say, a month long mission, uh, and then after a month, the CubeSat's still working. Well, you can go get extra data. You can keep doing the mission. You could even do a different mission using the same instruments or whatever. So um, there, there's some factors that play into that. But the CubeSats all have uh, different varying mission requirements and things like that. But uh, that orbital decay is a big thing because most of them don't have propulsion on board. Not all, but most of them don't, which means you can't boost your orbit. Uh, you're kind of at the mercy of physics, if you will. Uh, but definitely an interesting point to talk about. Another question here from Taylor asking, how many Rocket 3s will there be, and is there another rocket in the works? <laughs> well, there's always another rocket in the works here at Astra. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we uh, have a lot of exciting plans. Uh, today we are focused on um, this very exciting launch of LV0008, which represents a lot of firsts um, for us at Astra. It will be our first mission where we will be deploying a payload. Um, we are, of course, having our first launch from Cape Canaveral. If you've joined us in the past, the view is a little different from our mm -hmm. uh, regular launch site in Kodiak, Alaska. And, uh, and so we're focused on today's mission, but if you want to keep track on Astra's future plans, you can check out our website, astra.com, and follow us on social media as well. Looking forward to many rockets in the future. Coming up on uh, uh, hopefully releasing a hold before too long. Yeah, we're standing by for another update. We're currently, or we, the launch teams are currently in a hold. I'm just sitting here blabbering my mouth about it. But the launch teams are currently in a hold, uh, and we're going to stand by for a further update here. Again, the launch window extends until 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Uh, plenty of time to resolve this. So let's go ahead and listen into the countdown net and uh, wait for another update from Mission Control. This is Astra Flight on Countdown. Astra is picking the count back up at T minus 15 minutes at this time. And re entering terminal count. CDH confirmed for me that the first stage fuel tank is full and we do not require additional filling. Confirmed. 
For step 146, Tango, please inspect launch machine to prepare to set a new UTC T0 time. Ready. New UTC T0 time is hours 1 8. 1 8. Minutes 5 0. Minutes 5 0. Seconds 0 0. Seconds 0 0. Please save and commit. Save and committing now. And as you have just seen and heard, we have resumed our countdown and we are just inside 14 minutes from our new T0 time, which is uh, 10.50 a.m. Pacific time, uh, 1.50 <laughs> p.m. Eastern time. And uh, the team is proceeding into the final steps of preparing the vehicle for launch, our terminal count. In just a few moments, we'll hear our go, no go poll with our final uh, preparations and after that point we will be in uh, just a few minutes away from our T0. Looking forward to liftoff as the clocks are now ticking once again and are heading towards that new T0 again 1.50 p.m. Eastern Time 18.50 UTC. We can go ahead and listen into the countdown as they work through some more procedures coming up on that go no go poll. Let's listen in. Activating OX-1 OV-201 first fill. OX-1 OV-401 fill. Deactivating OX-1 OV-401 fill. OX-1 OV-301 upper fill. Deactivating OX-1 OV-301 upper fill. In machine fuel four operate toggle off first and full. Toggling off first, toggling off full. Please deactivate fuel four operate. Deactivating fuel four operate. Fuel three supply. Deactivating fuel three supply. Fuel one FV three zero zero upper fill. Deactivating fuel one FV three zero zero upper fill. Fuel one FV two zero zero first fill. Deactivating fuel one FV two zero zero first fill. AV one radios. Deactivating AV one radios. And deactivate AV1 rocket support cart. Deactivating AV1 rocket support cart. Please confirm for me that the following machines are still enabled and running. Zero stop purging. Confirmed. AV1 manage polling. Confirmed. AV1 manage power systems. Confirmed. The entire helium stack. Confirmed. Please activate machine igniter 1 spark test. Activating igniter 1 spark test. VB1 first stage power. VB1 first stage power is activated. VB1 upper stage power. Activated. VB1 turn on off PDBs. Activated. And water one water system. Activated. Tango, please activate launch machine. Activating launch. Please toggle locks topping at this time. Toggling locks topping. Per step 151, this is the Astra pole for tank pressurization and launch. After this point, any system issue must be called as a three word hold. That is a hold, hold, hold over the net. If there are no concerns for flight, call go. Otherwise, call no go. Red lead. Red lead is go. FTS. FTS is go. Delphin. Delphin is go. Ether. Ether is go. Odin. Odin is go. Inco. Inco is go. Ace. Ace is go. Launcher. Launcher is go. Orbit. Orbit is go. Booster. Booster is go. GNC. GNC is go. FAO. FAO is go. CDH. CDH is go. Tango. Tango is go. Safety. Safety is go. Flight is go as well at this time. Tango as in EV1 manage polling. Please toggle do only ground polling. Toggling do only ground polling. Teams have pulled and go Tango for the next up, we're going to load. Uh,
So as you just heard, sorry, I don't want to talk over the flight director there, but the teams have pulled go for launch, nine and a half minutes to go for a target liftoff time of 1.50 p.m. Eastern Time. Teams are going to be working through the rest of the terminal count here as uh, all systems are go, including the range, weather, and the rocket itself. Carolina, how are you feeling over in Alameda? The anticipation is certainly building over here in our final minutes before launch. Why don't we give a brief update, uh, or not an update, an overview of the mission timeline since we are now into the business end of the countdown. First yes. things for Yep, go ahead, Carolina. <laughs> sure. Uh, you can see the mission timeline up on your screen, and uh, at T minus three seconds, those five first stage Dolphin engines will ignite before our liftoff at T zero. And then we will very quickly begin our pitch over maneuver at T plus six seconds. If all goes well, we'll reach max Q at about one minute and 10 seconds. That's the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle and a very significant milestone. And then in very quick succession, we have main engine cutoff or MECO, fairing separation and stage separation. And then just, just around uh, three minutes and five seconds into flight, we have our upper stage ignition of our ether engine. And then ether will, will burn for about five and a half minutes before second engine cutoff or seco. And finally, we will deploy our four payloads, um, our four CubeSat payloads at eight minutes and 40 seconds after launch. And that will be a deployment sequence of a couple seconds between each satellite before CubeSat's all deployed in quick succession. And we are hoping that we get there in just about, well, eight minutes of countdown and then eight minutes of flight to orbit. So about 16 minutes or so, hoping to be on orbit and delivering those payloads. That would be an awesome sight to see. Again, if you are just joining us, this is Astra's first launch carrying payloads, actual satellites into low Earth orbit. Um, also the first launch from Space Launch Complex 46 here on the Space Coast at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Um, liftoff is targeted for 1.50 p.m. Eastern Time, seven and a half minutes to go. And you're listening to live coverage uh, from NASA Space Flight Thomas Burkhart here at Cape Canaveral and Carolina Grossman at Astra's headquarters in Alameda, California. Let's go ahead and listen back into the countdown net as the teams go through their final points. Should also point out that boat in the background is not an issue. That is outside the exclusion zone. Just realized you might see that in the view. I promise the range is green, I'm told. Um, the rocket is actually flying a different direction, so all good here. Uh, but yeah, as the teams get through these final steps, let's go ahead and listen back into the countdown net. V1 manage polling, toggle do both ground and guidance polling. Toggling, do both ground and guidance polling. Delphin, confirm GSE igniter system is ready for launch. Igniters are in good state, good for launch. FTS, issue logic on AFTU, verify CAS is green and nominal. Stand by. Logic enabled and mass enabled. Copy. Tango, verify vehicle looks ready for launch aside from tank pressures. Vehicle is ready for launch. Rock, this is flight on countdown. Rock. Astra is looking for final range green and launch authorization for this morning. Range green. And you just heard the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station range has confirmed range is green for the launch. Tango in the launch Coming machine, up. please toggle launch. Enabling launch. Coming up on five minutes, Flight Director Chris Hoffman will give the final briefings ahead of the final business end of the countdown. And the rocket is, before too long, going to be taking over internal control of the countdown itself and getting towards, towards liftoff. Five minutes. And 
played on Countdown with a reminder to all that any three-word hold call from here on out is an immediate abort regardless of source. Four minutes. Under four minutes to go to the launch of the Elena 41 mission on Astro Rocket 3 LV 0008. Rock, flight on countdown. Rock. Please verify the range is recording telemetry at this time. Verified. Thank you, sir. And a reminder to all Astra personnel, control room, if you require RF data, be prepared to switch over your Grafana sources at liftoff. MIFCO, flight on countdown. MIFCO. MIFCO, prepare to issue option when rocket IIP marker passes min MICO point and is within dispersed trajectories. Call out at time. MIFCO copies. Three minutes. There's a great view of the Astro teams in Alameda watching today's launch. Two and a half minutes to go. FTS at this time, send master enable and watchdog on AFTU. Thank you. Two minutes. Now passing two minutes till launch. Again, this is the launch of the Elena 41 mission for NASA. Four CubeSat hitching a ride on rocket 3.3 LV-008, Astra's first mission with satellites on board. Ready to lift off from Cape Canaveral, Florida in just under two minutes from now. Coming up on 90 seconds. 90 seconds. I'm going to leave commentary in the hands of Carolina Grossman at Alameda's headquarters, and good luck and Godspeed to LV0008. Enjoy the view, Thomas. Ace, flight on countdown. Ace here. Please start PSD recordings and downrange ground station recordings. In work. Sixty seconds, vehicles on internals. Forty five seconds, first stage tanks coming up to pressure. Thirty five, vehicle is at pre lift off tank pressures. 30 seconds. Twenty. Fifteen. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Evacuation, one, zero, abort. As you've just Launch heard, we had an abort at T0. Teams will look into the data, and we have time to try again.
So right now the team is getting the vehicle into a safe state as we look at the issue that triggered the abort. If we are able to reset the countdown, we would pick up again at our terminal count point of T minus 15 minutes. And we do have time in today's launch window, which extends until 4 p.m. Eastern. Copy and work. And as you saw, there was an abort at our T0 liftoff time. Looks like we did have engine ignition and an abort was called. The teams are troubleshooting the issue. Looks like the pad is safe and secure. No fires, no issues on the ground. Um, so thanks for standing by while the team looks at what, what happened in the final moments of our terminal count. And we will keep you posted with updates as soon as we can. We are able to recycle today's launch attempt. We would resume from T minus 15 minutes, the top of our terminal count. And we do have until 4 p.m. Eastern today in our launch window. And whether that recycle can occur will of course depend on the issue itself and how it can be resolved. So we'll stay tuned for those updates but like Carolina said, launch window does extend for a couple more hours, so uh, we're going to stay tuned and see what our status is, and we'll share that as soon as we have it. We actually did talk about this a little bit earlier in the broadcast, how the rocket is, of course, uh, designed to handle multiple fueling and ignition cycles. We are talking about the engine static fire test, which is a planned milestone before every launch. Um, to make sure that the systems are all healthy, goes through an entire countdown. Um, and so uh, the, the rocket does have that recycle capability, but just depends on what the actual hold or the abort was triggered by. Uh, but those aborts are all triggered by onboard commands, right, Carolina's uh, onboard computer sensing something is not quite right. That's right. So um, at uh, T minus 60 seconds, you heard that call out that the vehicle is on internal control. And it's all systems within the vehicle that are monitoring and making sure that everything is as it should. And if it isn't, an abort is, is triggered. So that's exactly what happened. That is, uh, the system is working exactly as it should. Um, and so we can uh, look at what caused the, the specific abort that was called. And the teams are already beginning to look through the data and, and troubleshoot. You can see that countdown clock stuck at 13 seconds. We'll expect to see that, of course, recycle uh, if a recycle is uh, feasible. Um, standing by for word on that, but that clock is holding right now as the teams assess the abort. 
While we wait for more status, we can go ahead and get back into questions. If you have any questions about today's mission, please tag at NASA Spaceflight in chat. And uh, we're going to go ahead and try to answer those and keep providing some more information on the mission. Uh, we'll also keep those updates forthcoming, though, as we have them. Um, the next question, uh, someone is asking, what happens if there is a range violation after liftoff? Does that warrant an FTS activation? Right, so if there is an issue after liftoff, we do have a flight safety system um, or FTS, a uh, flight termination system um, that is on board the vehicle. And so um, the FTS system uh, would be activated if, for example, the vehicle is uh, drifting off, off course um, and would ensure that we stay in the safe area. Um, we make sure that the keep out zones are clear before we launch um, to, to make sure that um, everyone on the ground, in the air, um, is as, as far away from the rocket as they need to be. Yeah, those range borders are actually monitored, not just those inside the, the hazard zones, but any of them, any vehicles that may be approaching the hazard zone too. So it's not, you know, ensuring the hazard zone is clear at liftoff, but then the question being about what if a range violation occurs afterwards, well, the relevant authorities are also looking at any nearby vehicles that could reach the hazard zone during, you know, shortly after liftoff and uh, making sure that they're all clear as well. So that's all coordinated and ensure that that will not take place uh, once the rocket's actually in the air. Another question here from Daniel asking, can Rocket 3 launch in the rain? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So there are lots of weather conditions that we uh, keep in mind in order to ensure a safe and successful launch. Um, a big one um, is is lightning. There's a big lightning protection system uh, around the rocket, which is so large you can't really even see it in the frame right now. Mm -hmm. um, we also keep an eye on winds. That was the reason for a hold earlier. Um, but rain itself actually isn't that big of a problem. Um, it's all of the you know, typical bad weather effects that come along with rain, such as lightning and wind. It would be appropriate for someone to ask what those towers are for right now, but I feel like we're preempted that question by talking about lightning protection a couple times. You can see in this frame there are some cables running down uh, on the left and right hand side of the rocket. Those are part of the lightning protection systems. They run up to the towers. And then uh, here's a great view from JD Park and you can see those two lightning towers more clearly there along with the mobile service tower which is of course not in use for Astra's rocket but has been used for other launches from Complex 46. Another question here from Skysurfer who asks, during a launch, do the cables, hoses, and electronics on that strong back get damaged from the heat? Right, that's a great question. So we do um, everything that we can to protect the system from that engine plume, those, those very hot gases that are exiting the first stage as the vehicle um, lifts off. Um, we do, since we, we um, light the engines a few seconds before T0, as well as conducting a static fire test, um, of a few seconds duration before um, before we make any launch attempt at all, um, we do uh, our best to protect all of the the cabling, hosing, electronics, etc., um, and uh, and you know do maintenance as as needed um, for the the uh, the bits that get a, a bit crispy. Yes. So I've seen some questions in chat about the venting that you can see on the screen. Uh, that is not them detanking the vehicle, right, Carolina? That's just nominal, just sort of stable uh, replenish venting. Right, that's correct. So uh, we, we pressurize the tanks um, a, few, a few minutes before T0 time, so we vent um, to make sure that we can uh, keep the vehicle safe and, and in a safe and stable sta state while it's on the ground, while the team is um, troubleshooting the issue that caused the the abort uh, right around T0. And on that front, the ground equipment will be able to top off those fuel tanks continuously, right? That's still taking place, uh, especially after a recycle? Right, we will, we will make sure that we're able to 
um, reach the appropriate levels and, and top off the tanks as needed. Again, if you are just joining us, this is the launch of Elena 41, a CubeSat mission for NASA, four CubeSats on board. Uh, the launch was just aborted right at uh, right about a moment before liftoff, um, and the teams are currently working to assess that abort and determine if a recycle will be able to occur. We'll provide that update as soon as we have it.
Thanks for standing by with us. If you're just joining us, we had an abort call just a few seconds before liftoff, and the team has been working to troubleshoot the issue. We are at this point keeping all of our options open, and we would recycle. You can see the clock's been reset preemptively to T minus 15 minutes and holding there. So we would recycle our countdown from the um, from the beginning of our terminal count at T minus 15 minutes. Uh, we'll continue to give you updates as we have them, but the team is keeping our options open and hoping to recycle today.
And thanks for standing by. If you are just joining us or waiting along with us, we had an abort uh, right around T0 of our launch attempt. Uh, the team has spent uh, the last approximately 45 minutes looking through the issue, and uh, we are, are doing some final tests to see if we will be able to attempt to recycle today's launch attempt. We have about an hour and 15 minutes remaining in the launch window, and we would pick up the count from T minus 15 minutes, so plenty of time to try again if we're able, and we are just standing by to see if the team is able to successfully complete the final test before picking up the count again.
This is Astra Flight on Countdown. Astra is scrubbing for the day. And as, and as you just heard, the flight director, Chris Hoffman, did just call a scrub for the day. Kieran, do you have an update for us? Yes, unfortunately, the abort um, that was around our, our T0 time is a minor telemetry issue that the team needs to work to resolve. So, um, unfortunately, we need to stand down from today's launch attempt. Thank you so much for sticking with us. And you can follow us on Twitter at Astra to hear the latest updates on our next launch attempt. Yeah, stay tuned for future coverage. And again, thank you to Ashtar for partnering with NASA Spaceflight for today's coverage. We'll be back with you as soon as another launch attempt is ready. But thank you so much for watching today. Thanks to all of the support and the chat messages and the NSF and Ashtar teams behind today. We'll hopefully be back with you very soon for another launch attempt. So signing off for now. Carolina, thank you so much for joining me today from Alameda in California.